Hi, everyone. Welcome to this info session. Glad to see so many people are here. So uh, what we wanted to do today is kind of introduce you to uh, what you can do as part of Engineer for Exploration. I'm guessing you probably have a lot of questions, right? And so that's what this info session is for, to answer your questions and kind of see like how you can get started. Um, so what is, what is the program actually about? Um, great. So um, the idea is we want to give you an opportunity to apply the skills that you're learning in your classes and maybe learn new skills, right? Things that um, you're not yet familiar with, you want to learn more about. And we do this in the context of um, real world applications. Specifically, we want to support scientists. So uh, people who work in, in conservation and ecology, right? So they, um, they may have technological needs. So they were like, well, I want to survey this area and I don't really know how to do this. Or it, the tools that are out there are way too expensive. They don't do the exact thing that I need. We need some engineering help. And that's basically why we're here. So we, we try to build stuff for them so they can do their really cool research in, in conservation, in ecology, in, in archeology, span in biology. Right, so that's that's the idea, and so so you working on these projects, you get the opportunity to to like work with these scientists, to work on real world problems, to make an impact, to apply skills that you're learning, um, and it may be a little a little daunting maybe when when you hear what uh, all these projects are about. You may feel like oh I, I don't know these things yet, I don't have these skills yet, and that's okay. Very few people who start this this program basically know all the stuff that they need for these projects. So um, this is also an opportunity for you for you to learn, right? So so don't feel like intimidated and that like you can only do this after having been at UCD for four years, right? Because that, that really doesn't make sense and you're about to graduate, right? So this this really makes sense uh, at any point of your career here. Right. If you if you feel like, hey, you want to learn more, you want to apply these things, you feel really motivated by these applications, please join, join our program. If you already have some background in these areas, that will help you kind of shorten the learning curve, but that's not, not necessary. The people who are the most successful in this program are the people who are the most motivated. That's really it. If you if you put in time, if you feel this is important, right? If this is kind of your passion, those people are going to succeed. Um, and so we will talk about a number of uh, these projects. So these are some of these are some of the projects that um, we currently have running. Um, these always change. So every year we add new projects. And so if you're part of this of this program, I hope you kind of see it as kind of your creative outlet, your the thing that you want to do outside of classes, right? Again. That's really where um, we get the most uh, successful students. If you, if you stay through this program, um, you're going to have an amazing resume when you graduate, and you're going to have a lot of really interesting experiences along the way. So um, the people who will be presenting on these projects are our project leads. There are students who kind of at one point were where you are sitting right now. Right? They started not knowing much about these projects, and they kind of we kind of took this leap, learned about them. Um, and then if you, if you stick with the program, you can become a project lead. You can go out um, and go on these expeditions. So the, the things that we build for these scientists are actually used in the field right, to do actual research. And so you'll learn how to work with real world constraints, right? These are not just toy problems. You're not gonna be following a line on the ground, right? So sometimes you think you know the problem, you try to solve it, that's not the actual problem that needs to be solved, but maybe you have to then pivot. Um, you'll be learning about the newest technologies, right? Because what we want to do is we want to take what's already exists and integrate it together. So you learn about system integration, but also like what's the newest thing that came out, right? The new thing came out, oh, we want to integrate that. Um, and then there are basically if you if, if you go through this and again there's a there's a learning curve in the beginning i'm not going to lie so you have to push through that so if you're motivated you push through that there are opportunities to do summer internships with us um, you can basically stay involved you can take on leadership positions you can go out on these deployments you can support these scientists um, a lot of really cool stuff to do 
So the first thing we're going to do is the, the project leads are going to talk about these different projects, right? Hopefully get, give you some idea of what's possible, get you excited. And then afterwards, there's an opportunity for you to ask questions, right? To see like how you can get involved, how you can get started, right? What you can get out of it, like what, what's, a really inter what's really interesting about these projects, right? So we want to, to offer a forum for you to ask us questions to basically to see like if this is the right program for you and like how you can, can contribute and, and be part of this, okay? So um, Nathan, anything else that you want to mention? Um, towards the very end, what we'll do is um, we'll, I don't know if, we're, if we've got the uh, signs out yet, but we'll go ahead and put some signs for each of the projects out around the room and we'll break up. And that'll be an opportunity for you to go and actually talk to each of the project leads individually. Um, if you have a resume, by all means, hand, uh, hand to the project lead and, you know, um, there's always opportunities to start that conversation about, you know, is there ways I can get involved? And, um, you know, it, it's entirely possible that, you know, we can start that conversation and get you started uh, right away. Um, and maybe it's not entirely clear whether that's, you know, that, you know, you're not maybe sure entirely if that's what you want to do. And maybe that has to be a longer conversation than just today, but at least we'll be able to start that and then continue that as we move through this process. Yeah. So there, there is a formal application process, but at this point, we're here to kind of get you excited for you to learn more and to see like if there's something you want to do. And, and one thing I, I forgot to mention is this, this program has been going on for quite a while. It's, it's been over a decade now. Um, and so we have uh, the two um, faculty leads. So myself, um, Kurt Sergis from the EC department and Professor Ryan Kastner that in the back. He's the other director of the program. And then we have Nathan here, who is uh, an engineer, um, basically part of, of the, the program and, and supporting a lot of these projects, right? So you'll you'll ha have professional support as well, working on these projects, which is really cool. Um, and Nathan actually started out also as an undergraduate in this program, right? As it started as an undergraduate and did his master's on E4D projects, and now he's he's working with us um, as an engineer. So lots of opportunities to grow. So lots of upward mobility, if you will. Okay, so, um, but yeah, let's get started and let's start talking about the projects. Cool. So we'll talk about, first about one of, uh, probably one of our newer projects. Um, definitely not something, something that we definitely want to keep uh, pushing on and developing. So this is the II sleep monitoring project. So let's talk a little bit, what, what are II? Uh, II are these endangered lemurs. They live in Madagascar. Um, and they're nocturnal, which means they are active most at night. Now, here, here the, there's we have a couple of them down in San Diego Zoo at Balboa Park. Um, and one of the interesting things is because they're in a zoo and they're nocturnal, but we're humans and we're dire. I mean, we're, we're awake during the day. So when we're walking around, they're asleep. And when we're asleep, they're awake. So you know, this part presents a problem. How do I, as a, you know, if I were a, one of the animal care specialists at the zoo, how do I keep an eye on them and make sure that they're doing well, right? I kind of want to sleep at night instead of, you know, spending time watching the uh, lemurs. It's not that, not bad to watch them. It's cool, but, you know, I kind of want to sleep as well, you know, have a reasonable sleep, sleep schedule. Um, so, you know, I have to have some way of monitoring them. So, you know, this is kind of the, of overlying or underlying premise of what we're trying to do. We want to set up some way so we can keep an eye on the eye as they awake during the night. Or, well, yes, awake during the night um, and see how they're sleeping during the day. So, you know, these are fair, fairly interesting. So we want to put a network of cameras out. Um, now, cameras on their own aren't that interesting. You, you, you know, if you have, you know, you have one camera looking at their enclosure and one camera looking at where they sleep, um, running 24 seven, that's already 48 hours of video for every day of, of, of time. That's a lot of video to go through. Um, and it's a lot of video to keep track of. So part of the problems here is we have to find ways to save that data in a reasonable format. We have to keep it in a place where we can understand where everything is and keep track of all, all of it. Which camera's pointed to uh, where, you know, where we're expecting each of these videos. 
And then after that, then we can start doing fun things. We can start throwing machine learning at the problem. We can start for computer vision. And we can start saying, okay, is I in this image or in this frame? Uh, where is it? How is it moving? Right? And so there's all of these interesting problems that we can start tackling with this kind of data. The other part of it is, are there other forms of data that we can use? Right? We have theories about, can we throw accelerometers onto uh, the sensors and animals? And will that tell us information that we want to know? So for this quarter, um, you know, we don't want to try and achieve everything. We, there's a very specific subset. And right now what we have is a series of cameras that we pretty sure work, uh, but we need to make them a little bit more robust. So we have some iron illumination that we're using to kind of light up the, the nesting boxes. So we need to do some work on kind of making sure that that actually is working correctly, making sure the cameras are properly focused, right? Uh, the camera's stuck up inside of a box. So, you know, it's kind of annoying trying to get in there and, and tweak it. And once you tweak it, you know, once it's done, you, you, we're not refocusing it. So we have to have some way of making sure that we're actually focused and, and all that. Um, and then the idea is that this will get sent to the zoo and they'll deploy it and they'll be using it for weeks, if not months on end. So we need to make sure that we're not handing them something that's going to break in a week. So we need to do our own stress testing and make sure that, you know, if we kick it, it'll still keep, keep working, right? Uh, and at some point, uh, and hopefully by the end of the quarter, uh, we can you know, try and push towards taking this up to the San Diego Zoo's safari park and getting it set up in one of their labs. And hopefully then we can you know, take a trip up there, uh, see kind of the other things that they have up there and, and have some, you know, see that this thing is working, right? So some of the key skill sets that we want uh, from here, all of our systems on this project, their projects are Linux based. So having, you know, we're definitely looking for people to either learn or have good familiarity with Linux, uh, definitely have a good familiar, familiarity with Python, uh, especially uh, multiprocessing or uh, multiprocessing and async IO are kind of two key concepts there that uh, kind of trip people up sometimes. Um, there's a lot of networking concepts that need to be understood here, right? We've got a networking, a network system. And so that has a lot of very intricate, interesting intricacies that can uh, rear their heads. Um, working with cameras at this point and trying really looking at that. So have it, being able to learn or having interest in learning about camera optics and lighting uh, is very important. As we end up uh, building this thing up and trying to get it really robust, having some interest or experience doing 3D, ugh, 3D printing or machining, right, will be very interesting um, or useful. So, you know, you kind of start making that eye proof and whatnot. Um, so I'll be around at the end, and you know, if you manage, not, if you can't stick around, then there's my email. will be on the slides uh, later as well. Any questions right this second? All right. Well, if not, then we'll go ahead and move on to the next project, which is the Boons project with Chris. Well, thank you. Nathan. Just want to make sure everyone can uh, hear me in the back, right? Perfect. Cool. So, um, as Nathan said, my name is Chris. I am the project lead of two projects here at Ebrief. Um, and the first one I want to talk to you about is the Baboons on the Move project. So, what's our goal here? Well, we want to be able to track and understand baboon social dynamics. So, how do we do that? Well, we need to capture video of baboons and, and track them. But while it might be easy here where we can see them well, we're actually interested in the baboons on their, at their sleeping sites, such as this, this large boulder. So uh, the, this can become quite problematic because this boulder can obstruct, obstruct your view, as well as any of these plants. So what if we put this in a drone? What if we put this on a drone and put it uh, way above the same boulders? And we now ask, ask where the baboons are. So before I play this baboon, I want you guys all to take a quick look, or play this video, excuse me. I want you guys to take a look, see if you can spot any of the baboons here. Who can see one? What about now, maybe? Can anyone see, see some movement now? So as you would expect, tracking the movement here seems to be at least one viable solution. So the question, the, the question that this project aims to be able to solve is, how do I track these baboons from, from footage like this um, over maybe consecutive days, consecutive hours, or at, least, at the very least consecutive videos? So 
We have partial answer to that. And we can track them as long as they continue to move. So now, it's a lot easier to see where these animals are now that I've drawn this box around them. And this is done automatically using, right, I'm just fixing the lenses. So this is done automatically using using the software that the software that we that we produce. Um, but as I as I've indicated, that ones here that stop moving are it loops. So how, so we have a number of questions. First is how do we fix this? And there are there are techniques used in robotics and other other techniques that can be used to kind of compensate for when you lose track of this data or lose track of these animals. And also, how do you find how do you compare this against other state of the arts that are that's designed for things like tracking cars and satellite footage or footage or, or pedestrians? So in order to do that, we're looking for a skill set. Yeah. Um, sorry. We're looking for a skill set of um, like OpenCV, some linear algebra, as images are all made are all matrices, some statistics potentially calculus, and having some language of maybe Python or C++. CUDA is kind of something that's, that it would be nice, but not necessarily something that we're going to harp too much on, especially because the, the chance that we hit the CUDA point this quarter are low. Um, as, I, as I kind of already alluded to, mostly looking for someone who can do computer vision work and uh, implement some some other competing models so that we can so that we can test those against our data set. Any questions before I um, and here's my for for everyone. Um, any questions before I go on to the next project? Yes. So 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 in this case, the Babylonian project is using um. Is using a uh, computer vision from consumer, from uh, just commercially available drones. So there's it is solely software at this point. Um, the next project is not. So my the next project I'll go into it does not it uh, does have both mechanical and electrical components. Anything else? Cool. So next project I'm going to talk a bit about is fish sense. So. What is fish sense? Well, fish, fish sense aims to be able to produce um, a camera that we can put in the water to be, able to, to be able to track and understand biodiversity over time. So if I give you an image like the one, the one behind me, the question is, how do you take this image and A, find, find the fish in here, but B, say, you know, this fish, how do I know how long, how long it is? How do I know how much it weighs? How do I know if I've seen this fish five years ago? All of these are questions that, that are open research questions that we're trying to solve. And these have applications in conservation, obviously research, and, uh, and, and aquaculture. So in conservation, again, we want to understand how does how fish health changes over time. It's a great indicator of um, how uh, climate change affects our ocean, how do you, uh, and how the, the health of, life of our reefs are, and all of these things. And as far as the research goes, we want to be able to understand maybe how fish migrate or, or like how, how they move over, over time. And the aquaculture, we want to be able to understand in fisheries how much food you have to, do, do you have to buy? Because you don't want to buy too much. How much, how is the health of individuals within your population? And to do that, we're going to build two platforms. We're going to build a citizen science platform. This is designed to be cheap, robust, and, and easy for e easy for non-scientists to use. How do we do that? Well, we're going to take just a standard dive camera and we're going to attach a laser to it. And as it turns out, with, with this laser, I now have the information I need to be able to go measure that fish. Because as soon as I can know how far away that fish is, I can know how long that fish is. Because, because the size of the size of my imager is related to how far away it is. So, so a little bit about this, about the goals of this dive camera. It's the benefits here are that system divers already likely have this. Um, 
but there's some there's some difficulties compared to other methods just just in the range of accuracy. We have a current MVP, which I'm going to leave here more, mostly for people reviewing the slides later. Um, but I want to talk, talk a little bit about how this lasering system works. So the intuition for this is if you consider, if, if, you, if you consider just your uh, like art theory that everything vanishes to a point. So things that are, so our first observation here is that things are infinitely far away converge to the single point. So the question is, what does the laser, the laser's projection onto your screen tell you about your distance to, to that infinity? Well, as it turns out, this laser follows your convergence lines. So the so the closer the closer you are to your edge, the closer you are to your camera. And you can and you can exploit that relationship. Um, I'm not going to go through the math here because uh, it's frankly beyond the scope beyond the scope of this presentation. But I'd be happy to talk about the math. Um, but I'm not going to talk. Uh, I'm not going to discuss the math here. Um, the second part of this is our scientific platform. So where we where we aimed at for the uh, system science platform that we wanted to be cheap and robust. The scientific platform is aiming for accuracy. So what does that look like? Well, our existing prototype for that uses an Intel RailSense along with the computer on board. So if I play this, you can actually see that this device that we built in IFN, we have uh, multiple of these modules upstairs. Again, absolutely, absolutely willing to answer questions about this, but it uses an Intel RealSense, a custom board, and a computer on board to be able to run, uh, to be able, to be able to collect data and potentially run um, some model, some ML models directly on chip. So this is that same that same device used um, used uh, in a, uh, with a diver uh, at the Birch Aquarium, but we've also deployed this in the ocean. And this is where where kind of the motivation for next steps come in. The data for this is um, less than ideal. So why is this? Well, the the kind the kind of camera we use is an off the shelf camera that has infrared. So that's what you're seeing here is is light from the from that infrared the infrared projector, and and uh, it's being reflected back at us. The other part of this is that is the resolution along with just the general dynamics of of cameras in the water. So and so other open problems that we have to contend with are how do we solve um, the transition of how do we how do we solve like distortions that come about because we have a lens in uh, uh, that we have interfaces between air, lens, water. Um, and once we do that, the, once we do have the answers to that question, though, the goal is to take data that sorry take data that looks like this, improve upon it so it looks looks like this, and we can we can label the fish and then detect the detect, detect how long they are. So obviously, there's a lot more that goes into that than I kind of led on here. But, and again, I'm happy to answer questions about the specifics, but for now, again, this is my, my contact along with a uh, contact of someone, who, uh, uh, someone else who's helping me manage this project. Any questions about that one? Okay, if not, then I'm gonna hand over for Mangrove. So hi everyone, my name is Edward. I'm one of the project leads for Mangrove Monitoring. I'm joined here by Jason, who is the other project lead. And so jumping right in, oops. Here, okay, so one question you might have is, what are mangroves? So mangroves are just a type of tree species that you are usually found in tropical areas. And so, for example, some of the areas that we've worked with include down in uh, Mexico and Jamaica, and they're usually characterized by their dangling roots. So if you see that picture there, uh, a lot of the roots are similar to water, but they're also above the waterline as well. And so, yeah, they're just a type of tree species that uh, 
we're monitoring. So one question you might be asking is why are we doing this? Why do we care about mangroves at all? So one important thing that mangroves do is that they can absorb a lot of CO2 from the environment. And I think you can imagine the benefit of that, especially in the context of climate change and global warming. So by monitoring and protecting mangroves, we will hopefully try to improve the environment by absorbing more CO2. Additionally, in areas that mangroves are, the communities in those areas benefit from them as well. So for example, mangroves can act as natural storm breaks and protect communities, as well as provide um, a, a way for the communities to kind of have a source of revenue in the sense that they can have fisheries, since areas that mangroves are in tend to have a lot of diverse species of fish. So there's a lot of benefits to the, to the communities as well as the environment. So as you can imagine, this is why a lot of researchers would like to work with the research that we're doing to support their monitoring and understanding of mangroves. So to accomplish this like mangrove monitoring, we sort of work with a lot of different technologies. So kind of what we do is we've got to acquire data somehow. So we go out to these remote places in like Jamaica or Mexico, and we fly these drones over these mangrove groves. And this is how we sort of capture images like the one in the top right of your screen or the presentation. Um, we get pictures like that and we have to sort of determine like which trees in that picture are mangrove and which are not mangrove. And we sort of do that using machine learning algorithms. So we sort of get this entire image and then we have to like break it down. We sort of classify pixel by pixel. Like we can like do a lot of like neural network stuff in order to sort of determine like which pixels actually represent mangrove trees and which are not. And we do all of this so we can give this information to scientists who are out in these mangrove fields and they're like sort of doing this work in real time. And we're kind of on the back end sort of providing this information back to them. And we're like relaying this information to make their lives easier. So this is like one of the drones that we fly. Um, so we work in like places like Mexico and Jamaica, and we sort of go out on the field. That's one of my favorite parts of the project. We're able to sort of go out to the fields and serve our local communities and sort of drones are one way that we can do it, like drones plus satellite imagery. So basically some skills that we're looking for for the machine learning side of things is that we're looking for people who have experience in computer vision and deep learning knowledge. We're looking for people with data science fundamentals and knowledge of data science libraries. Uh, we're looking for people who have experience with CNNs or unit architectures and also have some experience with TensorFlow or PyTorch. And we also prefer people who have some sort of experience with GIS or like geospatial workflows. And then for the software development side, so we're building a tool called the image classification tool. So the name is pretty self-explanatory. We're just giving, providing a tool where people can upload images that they want areas classified in the image to be mangroves or not. And so I listed some of the technology and frameworks that we're using. So it's just a full stack web application. So we got a front end, back end, we're using some cloud tools. And obviously we got testing, UI, UX, things like that. So if you use any of those technologies, frameworks, um, then we'd be happy to have you. So that's a little bit about the software development side. And that basically wraps up mainroom monitoring. So thank you for listening. If you have any questions, feel free to ask. Okay. I guess if there are no questions, we're gonna pass it off to the acoustic species team. All right. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Acoustic Species Identification Team. So what is this project about? It's basically about how uh, species can help us study, or how birds can help us study biodiversity and then be able to help protect the environment from that. So but climate change is slowly, ex uh, sorry, rapidly accelerating biodiversity loss, which means we're losing out on a lot of species and crucial wildlife. So we need to be able to monitor these environments. Uh, previous techniques such as, you may be familiar with some of these, such as like camera traps, putting out cameras in the environment, taking pictures, and then we just count how many animals are there, get a sense about how many species are in that environment. 
that's typically how most camp, uh, biodiversity work. You try to like detect some large creature, count how many large creatures are there, and then that's good. Except most large creatures, the most large creatures are very rare. There's not as many mammals as there are birds, insects, or flying creatures. So we end up missing a large part of the biodiversity and of these ecosystems that we could be measuring. That's where passive acoustic monitoring and our team sort of come into play here. Um, basically, there are a lot more animals that make noise that, than animals that can be very easily seen and counted. So if we can place some microphones in an environment, listen to those birds, birds sing, and then try to identify which birds are singing, what part of the, uh, of the audio clip, count how many times they, uh, they sing, their frequency, et cetera, et cetera. We can get a pretty decent estimation of way larger parts of the animal kingdom and get a better sense for biodiversity there. Um, it has a, a lot of advantages, namely it's way less labor to just go out one day and collect a bunch of, uh, to just put out uh, microphones let them sit for three months collecting data and then retrieve them as it is to try to like set up a, this cam camera trap array to try to like entice animals to come over and stuff. Yeah, it's so it's way less invasive because instead of having to uh, for camera traps, you kind of have to clear out the bush in front of the camera in order to see the animal. It's, if you put a camera in front of a bush, you're not going to be able to see anything. So just putting a microphone, you can get a much larger view of the entire ecosystem just by hearing the 360 degree view of sound. And of course, you get a lot of data pretty easily because animals will make sounds regularly throughout the day. You're lucky if you see an animal once a week in camera traps. Um, so the San Diego Zoo did this in 2019. They collected about three terabytes of audio data. I forget how many hours of that is, but I think that's like 30 hours, I wanna say. I'll have to double check that number, but a large a large amount of audio data for this purpose. Uh, the challenge is then being able to work through those hundreds of hours worth of audio data. A hum human beings in our testing that we found takes about three seconds to label one second of audio. So if you have hundreds of hours worth of audio, you're going to need a lot of human resources. And then if you want to keep doing that every single year in order to track the change in biodiversity, you're looking at a, hiring a very large team doing a lot of tedious work, and that's going to add up really quickly. And we're basically working with a nonprofit. So that's not a great solution. So it would be great if we could automate this somehow. And the great news about that is there's already been a lot of work. Bird song is one of like uh, one of a really good example of sound event detection. There has been Kaggle competitions that have resulted in models such as BirdNet. There have been other researchers who looked at identifying syllables and this and that. So there's been a lot, a lot of work done in basically um, the machine learning side of things. And even better, we can convert the problem to a CV problem by taking the audio and converting it to an image, the spectrogram. So with the spectrogram and CV, we have a lot of resources that have been researched, developed, money put into it in order to get us pretty good algorithms for being able to identify sound detection. The issue that we face, and the reason this project's been around for three months, <laughs> or three years, sorry, um, is that the data we have to work with is not the best. So most of the data around the world is really, really noisy. That's all. In terms of uh, species, say like deep in the Peruvian Amazon, deep in uh, Indonesia or or Africa, it's you're gonna get a lot. You're gonna get data that is really long, has a lot of audio, a lot of bird song in it, but it's not labeled at like the time series label. So here I have this clip right here with um, one bird species, and as a human, you can see very clearly that. It looks like that there's something here. And I'm gonna tell you right now, that's uh, the a screen piha. And you can say, okay, the bird is there and there's one bird. You can imagine, if you're familiar with working with machine learning algorithms and CV, you can see how if we feed this entire clip into the model and say, there is a piha somewhere in this clip, learn it. It might be able to do it, particularly for this example, but if you have overlapping species calls, a lot of noisy audio, stuff that is not birds, such as monkeys um, or a little bit more morbid humans, uh, poachers, uh, construction crews that have to clear out forces and whatnot. You can start to see how these things can cause problems if we just feed raw clips into the model. 
This is most of the data that exists publicly around the world. Most of the data is going to look like this. But what we really want is something like this. So the model has way less noise to train on. And as we all, as I'm pretty sure some of you may know already, garbage in, garbage out. So we want to try to reduce the amount of garbage we have. And that is the big challenge of this project is how do we do this when we don't have strongly labeled data to learn from? So we've come up with two solutions that we've uh, worked a bit of with the team. The first has been our weekly to strongly label pipeline um, in a pipeline package that we've called PHA, named after the screen PHA. We really like the screen PHA on this team. The idea is we make the assumption that if we're going to have a data set with, that contains birdsong, it probably has some bird in it. So if we just run a binary bird, no bird classifier, we can identify the bird. And then if we already know that there is that bird somewhere in that clip, then we just take that uh, species level data. We take the bird detection and we say, this bird detection is that species. It's not a proven strategy, but it's, it's, it's a heuristic. Like if the model detects this little bit of noise as a bird, then we say that, uh, we say a PHA is that bird detection, but it might not be. So to help support that, we were developing uh, unsupervised clustering techniques in order to try to filter out some of those noisy data, because we figure that most of the bird detections, if they're of the, of the same species, they should cluster more closely together. With that, we can build out a data set of strongly labeled data, train one of those fancy uh, CV algorithms we talked about on the previous slide, and then make some pretty decent regional uh, specific classifiers. Yeah. Um, yeah. So here's some contact info and stuff, and we forgot to add in a what we're looking for slide, but uh, we'll talk a bit about, I'm going to just talk a bit about that based on what I've shown previously. So a lot of the model stuff already exists out there. We're not going to be doing too much stuff in terms of like rigorously building with the, with the models. We're going to try to do some work to uh, support the models, such as data augmentation, unsupervised clustering to try to filter out, filter out uh, poorly labeled annotations because all the training data we're going to train on, the labels will be, will be partially automated by uh, the binary bird detection, right? So what we're really looking for is People, uh, people who have experience with working with really noisy data sets that may or may, that you had to do a lot of data cleaning on in order to filter out a lot of uh, some of the poor labels, people who have experience with unsupervised clustering. And then if you have CV experience, maybe some works of augmenting some of the ResNex. Oh, sorry, I'm running out of my voice. <sighs> um, people working with augmenting some of the CNNs and RNNs that you may have used for computer vision to tackle particular data sets. That's the kind of thing we're going to be looking for on the team. So more generally than that, standard Python uh, scientific libraries, Python, Pandas, NumPy, uh, TensorFlow, and PyTorch. Uh, we kind of use a bit of both since everyone seems to use their own standard and we try to look at a bunch of different models. So familiarity with both or one or the other, those things help. Yeah. yeah anything more? Awesome. All right. Uh, with that being said, I'll pass it off to Smartman, I believe. Radio, 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 radio tracking, tele, or radio telemetry tracking. Yes. Thanks, man. <laughs> Sorry. All right. Yes, it is us. Radio telemetry tracking. Hello, my name is Hannah Grimm. Um, I'm a third year undergrad, so uh, hopefully I'm not intimidating. Uh, come and talk to me later. So for our project, we're interested in tracking animals to monitor them and uh, just where they are in the environment. But traditional on foot methods are really unwieldy. Like if you look at these people going through the difficult terrain, holding this unwieldy antenna, it's not ideal. Uh, so what we want to do is develop this drone and tower system that can track animals based on little uh, radio, like whatever signals that they'll that'll emit from the little tracker thing, signal emitters. Yeah, um, uh, our drone or tower, whatever it is, will pick up those signals. 
uh, relay that back to our ground control station, and we can then determine from where we got those signals, where are these animals. Uh, we have a couple sub projects going on right now that I want to talk to you about. One is uh, tracking common collared lizards in Arkansas, um, and that will be basically tracking them over some predefined area, but re like checking every 10 or so minutes, okay, where are they now? Do we see any more? Where have they moved? Uh, that sort of thing. And the other sub project here is Turks and Caicos Islands, where we want to track boas. Um, but this will be over a more undefined kind of hazy uh, area of habitat. So we'll start with TCI. Um, again, this is tracking boas and it's a collaboration with the San Diego Zoo. Um, like I mentioned, large open area, that's kind of difficult because they could be anywhere. Uh, so what we have is this drone that we can fly over in a lawnmower pattern, whatever that area is. Um, an antenna sticks out of the drone, imagine my hand's a drone, flies over and gets all those signals from any boas falling along the ground or trees. Um, so right now, some goals we have are mostly just testing system validity and consistency. Um, we've had some issues with uh, the range of how far we can actually communicate with our drones, so we're working on that right now. Um, but to illustrate here, just a simple diagram, imagine there's a boa in the grass for some reason. Signal gets transmitted to our journey with the only computer that gets then sent to our GCS where we can kind of see a, a map of where we're getting these signals. Um, Arkansas, that's a fun lizard. Um, so this is tracking common collared lizards and we're collaborating with uh, researchers at the University of Central Arkansas. Um, unlike with TCI, we're actually tracking within a predefined area, but now the new challenge is, again, checking every 10 minutes have these lizards moved. So what we are working on is setting up multiple towers so that instead of having to fly a drone every 10 minutes, like that's a lot of work, um, just set up towers around that area since we already know what the area is. Um, and let those towers basically wake up every 10 minutes, see, hey, where are the lizards? And then just go back to sleep for 10 minutes until time to wake up again. Uh, current goals, this is more than we're gonna finish this quarter probably, um, but communicating to a sleep timer that tells these towers when to wake up and go to sleep, kind of controlling that, um, actually composing the electronics for our tower, building those towers, um, allowing the towers to determine how long can they sleep for, um, depending on, you know, if it, they have to take some time to actually see, hey, are the lizards nearby? And then there's gonna be time to go to sleep, time to wake up. So what's left for actually going to sleep, not using that energy um, to stay awake all the time. And finally, we'll have to integrate the tower functionality into the existing code base, but that will likely come later. Um, similar to the boas, here's a little diagram we're imagining we have some like square area in this case. Um, lizards crawling around here every 10 minutes, towers wake up, see where these lizard lizards are, send that data to the GCS, go to sleep again. Uh, current areas are, that we're working on, um, digital signal processing, uh, we want to introduce support for uh, multiple concurrent radio trackers. That is um, getting multiple different signals at once instead of just like one lizard um, at a time. Uh, in terms of hardware, we need to, again, construct those radio towers. And we're also working on uh, constructing and testing a drone mount. Uh, and some other miscellaneous software items are uh, integrating communication with our sleep timer and scheduling uh, sleep periods. I did not <laughs> put specific skills we're looking for. Um, those are listed on our open positions at E3 under the radio telemetry tracker, but um, D DSP, networking, um, I think mechanical is going to be handled separately right, in a different team. No? All right. Well, mechanical engineers wanted. Um, <laughs> 
And general, just object oriented, like be familiar with that. Um, we would love to have you just get some more hands on deck. Um, please contact me. My email's there for a reason. Happy to talk to you about the project here or just after the presentation. Um, and then links for more project info on our website and the actual application. Um, any, any questions? No? Okay. Think smartphone? Yeah, now it's smartphone. All right, so uh, this is SmartFin, um, and just briefly I'll explain what it is before going through why why this project came about in the first place. Um, okay, so this is this is what a SmartFin looks like, and if you've ever served before, um, when, when you serve on the underside of, of your surfboard, there's a, sort of looks like a shark fin, just like that, or there could be multiple, uh, but the purpose of them is to, to make, to, for, for one, stability in water, and so it makes it so that you have something to dig into when you make your surfboard turns. So what we do is we take that dumb piece of plastic under a fin, uh, we put sensors in it, and we call it the smart fin. Um, it has tons of sensors on it, like the accelerometer. It can tell if it's in water or not. Um, it can tell what direction it's heading in. It has GPS for, for, for which location, um, and a temperature sensor to tell what temperature the water is, things like that. Um, so the big question is why do we want to do this? And right now, the primary way um, we collect oceanographic data is through buoys, like Scripps Pier, for example. Uh, it has a buoy at the end. But the problem with buoys is that it's located very far into the ocean, and it misses what, what oceanographers call the surf zone, um, which is sort of where, where the waves break into the water. Um, we want to be able to access that data and secondly, if you have hundreds of surfers like you have in San Diego, you can collect so much more data than what an individual buoy would be able to collect. And then we send this data to, to scientists at Scripps and we can analyze it, find patterns um, in the data that we collect and link it to climate change patterns, uh, things like that. So, um, so for example, this is poorly graphed, but um, sort of, this is sort of like the data you get when you just uh, go to the, when you plot it, when you take the fin out into the ocean, as you can see, it's extremely messy. There's not a lot of discernible patterns, um, but that's just because of how the ocean is and a lot of the limitations of, of the fin, right? Um, so uh, our current, as part of our current efforts, it would be great if when you're in the ocean, there's uh, models in, in oceanography that link the wave height of the ocean, like maybe certain times, certain locations, things like that, to patterns in climate change. So what we're going to do is able to accurately measure the, the height of, of each wave, um, height of the wave when, when the fin is in the ocean. And ideally, a wave just moves up and down, a transverse wave, and we use that information to calculate what the height of that displacement is and use that to calculate wave height. But since the ocean is so so messy, there's a lot of different factors going on. It's extremely hard to do that just by double integrating the acceleration to get position. So what we do is we're using a thing called the common filter, specifically an extended common filter. Um, and that makes it possible so that we can fuse sensor fusion. We fuse all these sensors on board that we have, accelerometer, magnetometer, um, a bunch of other things. And we use that to create a much more accurate prediction of what the actual displacement is. Um, so there's a couple words here, uh, but basically the whole thing is if you're if you're really good at signal processing, uh, you'd be good. You'd be a good fit for SmartFin. But also since we're dealing with so much data, uh, if you're familiar with NumPy, MATLAB, uh, or just familiar with working with data, manipulating it, finding patterns in it, uh, you'd be a great fit for SmartFin. Um, Finally, yeah, uh, for more info, uh, yeah, there's smart from there on us on the long board. Um, yeah, feel free to email me. Uh, I think there's something at the end with everyone's contact information. And that's just the general e for website. I think this is the last one or yeah.
Cool. So one thing I want to talk about is one thing that we're kind of making a new thing is our hardware development group. So what we've, what's happened previously is that E3 is a systems engineering team, right? All of our projects revolve around building a system, which involves having people doing mechanical engineering, electrical engineering, and software. But you know, if you think about all the projects that we've talked about, there, you know, there's a huge emphasis on developing software and whatnot. And so what happens, unfortunately, previously, is that we build this, you know, the mechanical guys build this amazing thing. Then software takes it, you know, mucks with it for a year, and this hardware guys are sitting there twiddling their thumbs wondering what, what they need to do, right? Which is really unfortunate because there's just so many cool things that we can do as, with hardware and with all these other products that we have going. So this is what our hardware uh, development team is now. So this is kind of, it's a little corporate-y, but you know, it's, we're, we're centralizing our hardware resources. So now if you like to work on hardware, you don't have to get, we, we don't want you to be tied to a single project and then sit there, you know, confused and whatnot, or, you know, bored and, you know, not, not have anything to do. So what we want to do is, you know, bring everyone together. Now hardware people can help each other. Um, we can also let you jump from project to project uh, and be able to learn more. And so now that gives you the ability to contribute to a large variety of projects throughout your uh, time at E4E. You can learn a whole lot of things, right? We've got projects with all sorts of different applications, right? Drones, underwater, uh, electronics, low power electronics, right? These are all varying things that you'll find. And if you go into industry, right? These are very separate industries, you know, very separate fields that oftentimes don't really intersect. So this is really a great opportunity that where you can go and play around with each of these applications and learn about them. And you know, because now we have the centralized pool, right, there's always gonna be something to do and learn, right? You're gonna finish with one project, and as soon as you're done, we're gonna have another project that needs uh, something to be done, right? So as soon as Fishnets is done building their uh, weird laser camera thingy, right? We'll be pushing people on and move working on radio collar stuff or you know uh, smartness stuff or whatnot right so there's always things happening so right now right we're, we're kind of really focusing on these three uh things within this hard within the hardware development group right and it's going to evolve it's going to change as each of these projects continue to grow and and change so right right now really focusing on fish sense with underwater cameras uh, rate of flow tracking, uh, especially low power electronics, right? That's a really cool field if you all want to get into it. Um, really awesome things that can happen, really weird hacks that you can do to make things work. Um, and if you really want to get in an industry, right? If you can do low power electronics, there are not a whole lot of people that do that. And so your skills will be in very high demand. Um, and then I uh, monitoring, which you haven't quite spun up uh, ready yet, but hopefully we will. And that's making things lemur proof. And so that'll be its own fun thing of you know, how do you make things lemur proof? So kind of, you know, key skill sets, which is basically everything under the hardware sun. Um, kind of like SOLIDWORKS here. So if you want to learn that or know it, right, that, that's, a, that's a plus. Fabrication, right, it's kind of looking at 3D, 3D printing, laser cutting. Um, and we do have a, mil, a drill press and a bandsaw that we can utilize, but you know, we're trying to focus on kind of the uh, more prototyping st style fabrication methods. Um, electrical design, we like our Eagle and Altium. And so if you have experience using either of those, that'd be great. But a lot of the other, kind of the other major thing is being able to, uh, we'll, we'll show you guys how to, we'll teach doing soldering, hot air rework. Um, and we'll definitely focus a lot on kind of how do you do really good electrical testing. Right, we've got a couple of actually really cool tools that aren't listed on here that are useful to learn and be aware of how to use. Um, so I'll be around uh, if you want to talk, and uh, we can uh, you know kind of figure out kind of where that will fit if you want to do that. Any questions about kind of hardware development and whatnot? Cool. So there's, as Kurt mentioned earlier, there's opportunities to take leadership positions within E4E. Really big thing is, you know, that gives an opportunity to take ownership of a project and really push it to where you want to see it, right? You know, you are now driving that vision for where things go. That's also a really awkward, good opportunity to take deep dive into technical details. For example, last week, Chris and I and Kyle spent four, five hours in a room working on math. 
on some really cool math, but math nonetheless. And that, you know, it's stuff that will actually lead into papers. And that's a really good opportunity with all these projects is if you get more into that leadership position is getting, being able to write papers, get involved in those sort of things. And those will be really awesome things to go on a resume when you apply to grad school or for a job, right? Um, my first job immediately, I apologize, it wasn't at UCSD, but it was at another company. Because I had that leadership experience, you know, the that was pretty much 80% of the interview was talk, tell me about the project, right? And so that's also kind of going to your leadership position. Uh, Chris, I don't know. I will ask for a second that. Um, I have been, I have been, I, I have been the um, I have asked those questions about those projects. Um, are you able to tell me about, your, about a good project that, that you were able to do? Yeah, that looks really good. So, so it, there is a lot of value to be, to be about it. So, and I guess I was, I was a manager in, a, in software, I was a software development manager in the industry, and I made lots of decisions on what we got. Other uh, cool perks about, you know, trying to get moved towards that is opportunities to travel, right? All, a lot of our collaborators work in field sites, not in North America. Uh, radio tracker, uh, search and that's in that's out in Latin America. Uh, with the fish sense project, where those deployments are look, looking like they're going to be in Baja this summer. Uh, mangrove is operating in Latin America and Mexico, right? So, really great opportunities to get once you get involved, right? You get to go on to those deployments. Um, and lastly, of course, as Kurt mentioned, right, there's opportunities to get involved and in, to do some internships and whatnot, and so there are funding opportunities once you get more involved and into more of those leadership positions. So how can, I, how can you be successful as a student, right? Kind of the biggest things is that ability to learn on your own. Um, and that's kind of one of the things that we really look for is your willingness to take a small, pro small problem that we have and dive into it, learn on your own, you know, go try things, right? Um, we want, we'd like, we very much like to see people who, you know, I'll go you know, to, to go look at YouTube videos, go look at Stack Overflow, all those things, and just continue to learn more and more about that, right? Um, because that's going to let you contribute more. It's going to, to enable you to branch out into various different aspects of the project and, and you know, be that dynamic contributor that's going to get you more involved, mm -hmm. right? And just being able to communicate to the rest of the team and, um, you know, be on the same page. So how can you get involved? So right after this, what we're going to do is we're going to have the project leads spread out across the room. So you'll see signs around the room with projects on them. So if you're interested in that project, go talk to that lead over there. Um, you can't stick around and, or if you're listening on the recording that we posted uh, later tonight, whenever I get around to it, um, fill out the intake form, right? That's online, e3.ucsa.com join. Um, the applications close next week, Wednesday, April 12th, uh, around 6 p.m. We're ready to get home to turning it to closing those. Um, so don't push the deadline, but there might be a bit of flex there. Um, and once you do that, uh, we'll probably send you an email probably by the 14th sometime. Um, again, it depends on whenever we get around to sending those emails. Um, but that after that, then we'll start uh, working through interviews and whatnot, and we'll just continue that uh, conversation. That way we can see where you best fit and how to get you onboarded. So if you have any questions, right, feel free to reach out to all the all of the people. Um, this is one of two, several uh, contact slides um, for all the students. We'll just use that one because this has all of us, so all the project leads and then all of our staff. So we'll go ahead and we'll go ahead and break up into those various groups and let us know if you have any questions. I'm <laughs> 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 